Tonight, the new concern for Canadians struggling with high prices. So I'm really not sure what the winter's going to look like. We might be wearing a lot more sweaters. Why there's growing talk about a possible recession. With soccer's World Cup just a month away, the off-pitch battle for Canadian players. Canada soccer is now learning the reality of A being relevant on the world stage. My conversation with Canada's most famous oh, science I'm, broadcaster. I'm an elder, and as an elder, this is the most important part of my life. David Suzuki with stories to tell and breaking news to share. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. In the midst of a tough financial time for so many Canadians, there are growing warnings tonight of a recession on the horizon. With inflation still stubbornly high, the Bank of Canada is expected to boost the interest rate again. Many economists expect that hike to come this Wednesday and predict an increase as much as 75 basis points. That would bring the rate from 3.25% to 4%. But that tool aimed at fighting inflation can also slow down economic growth. Marina von Stackelberg looks at the warnings and who's voicing them. Davis, are we grocery shopping? Gina Kokoska has cut down on every expense she can think of. She even cut her maternity leave short. Her family can't afford to not have her working. We have the means to, to manage things right now, but... If things continue on the way they are, I'm, I'm even questioning if that's going to be feasible. Kokoska says her family is going further into the red every month. When we're coming into winter and the cost of heating is, is exorbitant. So I'm, not, I'm really not sure what, what the winter is going to look like. Um, we might be wearing a lot more sweaters this year. Canada's economy has actually been somewhat protected thanks to the high price of commodities this country produces, including energy. Speaking on CBC's Rosemary Barton Live, the International Monetary Fund's chief economist warns Canada is not immune to global economic pressures. There's a slowdown in the U.S. that is coming. Uh, commodity prices, uh, energy prices are coming down. Uh, there are all the uncertainties and the financial tightening. Financial markets are very nervous. All of these factors are going to weigh down on, on the Canadian economy next year. On top of that, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused turmoil with the price of fuel and food. The IMF says global growth is expected to slow down next year to 2.7 percent. It's not a global recession, but it's a fairly low number. To keep inflation under control, central banks around the world, including Canada's, have responded by hiking interest rates. But doing that then slows economies. The Bank of Canada's former governor said earlier this week Canada should fare comparatively well to other countries, but... I think uh, recession is both likely globally um, and, uh, and uh, most probable in Canada. Marina, one of the big issues for Canadians right now is the cost of food, and it has outpaced the rate of inflation. Yeah, the cost of food has risen more than 11% since this time last year. We haven't seen a hike like that in 40 years. And Statistics Canada says... The price of food depends on the cost to produce it. Think things like fertilizer, labor, and transport. And as we head into the winter, where more of our food will need to be shipped from elsewhere, instability across the globe could cause the price tag of our groceries to continue to climb. All right, Marina, thank you. And at a time when many Canadians are cutting back, we have new data showing a spike in spending in the federal civil service. Jonathan Gatehouse shows us the cost of a pandemic hiring spree. It's ridiculous. I go by the rules and, and I'm stuck. More than ever, Canadians relied on their government during the global pandemic, even if that sometimes meant long lines and wait times for essential public services. Someone has to come here and make changes because it's only gonna get worse. Ottawa spent hundreds of billions responding to COVID-19 challenges, beefing up overburdened departments like the Canada Revenue Agency in public health, and in the process, created the biggest and most expensive federal workforce in Canadian history. In the first two years of the pandemic, the public service added 35,000 jobs, a 12% increase, sending payroll costs soaring by as much as $8 billion, according to some estimates. Ottawa now employs a record 335,000 bureaucrats. That doesn't include 28,000 who are on long-term leave, with many still receiving health coverage and other benefits. The government is just getting bigger. 
Kevin Page, a former parliamentary budget officer, now heads a think tank on public financing. He wonders if anyone in Ottawa is paying attention. There is no like st- strategic human resource plan, you know, for the government of Canada, some kind of holistic sort of plan that um, that we need to grow. There's not evidence one way or another whether or not we've made really good hiring decisions. The supercharged growth of government is also a concern for private sector lobby groups. Gosh, we're we're into some lean economic times, uh, potentially heading into a recession. Uh, a giant civil service is not going to help us in terms of remaining lean enough to be able to respond to challenges uh, and, and prevent further tax increases to pay for it all. But economists like Armin Yelnesian note there's always a price for delivering the services that people need and want. What would you cut if you didn't want to add that cost? What kind of services would you not want? Maybe less emergency pandemic uh, response uh, income supports, maybe fewer wage subsidies, maybe fewer temporary foreign workers, maybe less training or EI. The federal government insists they're watching the bottom line, telling CBC News they're focused on delivering support for Canadians while responsibly managing public funds. But the most meaningful numbers, like average salary, haven't been updated in over three years. Back then, the cost of a public servant to taxpayers was already $121,000 a year, a figure that has surely grown, now multiplied by 35,000 new hires. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson will not enter the UK Conservative leadership race to replace Liz Truss. Johnson had claimed to have gained support of more than 100 Tory MPs, that was the required threshold, but far fewer have declared their support publicly. This seems to clear the way for the former British tra- Chancellor, Rishi Sunak. His only opponent, longtime MP Penny Mordaunt, doesn't have enough nominations yet. Sunak could be declared the winner as early as tomorrow. It's the opposite situation in China tonight. That country's leadership has been cemented for the next five years, with President Xi Jinping wielding more power than ever. At the tightly controlled Congress of the Communist Party of China, Tally Ricci shows us a moment of drama that may hint at what's to come. When China's most powerful figures gather once every five years for a Congress of the ruling party, nothing on camera happens by accident. So the sudden removal of former General Secretary Hu Jintao has people talking. At first, he seems to be caught off guard and to resist. He trades a few words with his successor Xi Jinping before his escorts shuffle him off. His failing health was given as the official reason, but this happened at the climax of a conference where Xi solidified his power like never before and began an unprecedented third term at the top. The extraordinary removal of Mr. Xi's predecessor, Hu Jintao, um, the head of, of a, the Youth League faction in the party, uh, is really sending out a rather chilling signal about um, people who may wish to suggest to Mr. Xi that his policies could be reconsidered. The party also named a seven-member standing committee. President Xi Jinping promoting allies who support his vision of tighter control over society. Every leader will need some supporters to help him to maintain, to control the country and to pursue then to continue uh, his policies and then to build up his legacy. In a nearly two-hour speech, she called on China to be prepared to deal with worst-case scenarios and to be ready to withstand high winds, choppy waters, and even dangerous storms. The speech was very strong and affirmed everything that we have been concerned about with regard to China's domestic and international um, agenda. As the country deals with economic uncertainty, many were also watching for changes to China's strict COVID-0 policy, which has shut down cities and disrupted businesses. However, no changes were announced. Politics is unpredictable, in, especially in authoritarian politics. But uh, we'll see what's going to happen in the next five years. And if any of the events that unfolded on Saturday were political theatre, they leave no doubt who's in charge. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Russia and Ukraine exchanged heavy fire this weekend near the end of eight months of war. Ukraine's energy infrastructure is a key target, forcing resources to be stretched. As Magda Gebersalasa shows us, it is stoking fears of a cold, dark winter ahead. Shattered glass, twisted metal, and broken bricks. 
scattered across a residential area in the southern Ukrainian port city of Mykolaiv. Russia's missiles attack taking out the top of this building, flying debris, damaging others. This woman says she heard the first explosion and went looking for shelter. Then she heard another explosion. I saw the fire, I could smell the gunpowder, she says. Recent attacks have struck Ukraine's residential and energy infrastructure. On Saturday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia launched 36 rockets. An official said the ones that landed left more than one million households without power. It is a deliberate policy by Putin to target and kill civilians and to try to damage the civilian infrastructure so that people are facing shortages of heat and light. When, when they uh, hit our electricity stations, that were more disturbing. The call to conserve energy is out and rolling blackouts are on in Kyiv. For the last week, uh, we had, I think, four or five times. Disturbing accusations keep coming from both sides. Ukrainian officials warn Russia has plans to blow up a hydroelectric dam in Kherson. The area is under Russian control, but Ukrainian forces have been gaining ground. Russia's defense minister claimed that Ukraine could use a dirty bomb, an explosive device that also has radioactive material. Zelensky dismissed that claim, pointing the finger at Russia for threatening the use of nuclear weapons. He again called for more help, saying the stronger the support Ukraine gets, the sooner the war will end. Magda Gebrselasa, CBC News, Washington. A Russian military jet has crashed in Siberia, killing two crew members. The warplane slammed into a residential building, but officials say no one on the ground was hurt. There was a similar event last Monday, a jet crashing into an apartment block in southern Russia near Ukraine, killing at least 15 people. Today's incident is the 11th non-combat crash of a Russian warplane since its forces invaded Ukraine. An update tonight on the health of author Salman Rushdie, who was attacked back in August. Rushdie's agent confirms the author is blind in one eye and has lost the use of one hand. Rushdie was stabbed multiple times in the neck and chest by a young man who rushed the stage during a lecture in New York. U.S.-born Hadi Matar is charged with attempted murder. Tonight, there's a growing problem in Canadian hospitals. Amid staffing shortages, more patients are suffering from bed sores. Now an Ontario family speaking out after their loved one's painful death. And a warning, this go public investigation from Erica Johnson contains some graphic images. We shouldn't be looking at this. Nope, because it should never have happened yet. Alice O'Leary and her daughter Kelly pour over the names of friends and family who came to their loved one's celebration of life. An honor to be here today celebrating your dad. You were an amazing daughter. Ken O'Leary died last February after developing a deep bed sore at the base of his spine, a skin injury due to prolonged pressure on one spot. It developed after he was admitted to this Southern Ontario hospital to help sort out some medications. I saw this gaping hole and his grimacing face from pain. It was heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. A wound she describes as the size of an avocado. So deep it went right to the bone. But while it worsened, no hospital staff told his family for weeks. Had I known, oh my God, we would have been on top of it right from the beginning. Bob Wilson died after months in the same hospital three years earlier. He'd been admitted for a brain injury, but developed a bed sore that grew to the size of a football on his lower back. The amount of emotions that went through us was unbelievable because we were never told and we were there every day. The number of pressure injuries acquired each year while in hospital is climbing steadily, largely due to the chronic nursing shortage. No time to regularly reposition bed-bound patients, critical to prevent bed sores. Nurses have been sounding the, the alarm for years saying, we're, we're, we're strapped here, we need help. And now, unfortunately, things are really coming to a head. 
A spokesperson for Joseph Brandt Hospital declined an interview request, but did say Ken O'Leary's case underscored the importance of clearly communicating with families. Families we spoke to said that's exactly what they want. And for hospitals to have enough staff to head off the problem in the first place. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. If you have a story and you want to go public, send us an email. Go public at cbc.ca. Soccer's World Cup is less than a month away, and for the first time in 36 years, the Canadian men are competing. But players are locked in a battle over money with Soccer Canada, and both sides seem to be digging in. Georgie Smythe has that story. Alfonso Davies keeps it himself! He's the star player for Canada Soccer. Alfonso Davies, known to fans as Fonzie, the fast-moving wing-back in the number 19 jersey. But that shirt may soon be hard to find. According to a TSN report, his agent says Davies hasn't agreed on a financial deal that would allow retailers to sell it. I'm not sure this is fair. Told you I was good at saving. One orange? The 21-year-old does have some endorsements, like a partnership with BMO. His agent reportedly says that, as with those commercial relationships, Davies should benefit from the sales of his jersey. Biggest stars will have deals in place about using the likeness and royalty deals uh, with the federations. Sports commentators say deals like this are common in the world of soccer. Canada soccer is now learning the reality of A being relevant on the world stage when it comes to football or soccer. And they're also learning the, what it's like to have a bona fide superstar on their team. It's not the organization's first public disagreement about money. In June, the team cancelled a game after national team players wanted a larger cut for making the World Cup. Canada soccer says the players' proposal wasn't financially viable. A soccer Canada represents a million soccer players and and it's it's not easy for the governing bodies to be in a healthy financial position and one and Jersey merchandise and apparel revenue um, is is a major revenue stream for the association. The World Cup is just four weeks away, not long to resolve a dispute ahead of a competition where team yeah, unity is crucial. Friday. Georgie oh, Smythe, wow. CBC News, Vancouver. Tonight, Canada's Felix OJ Aliassime is celebrating another big win. Fantastic Felix OJ Aliassime. The Montrealer defeating American Sebastian Corda in straight sets to win the European Open. Aliassime has been on quite a roll lately. This is his second title in two weeks. The 22 year old is ranked 10th in the world. Some big news to share with you tonight. After more than four decades, CBC journalist and environmentalist David Suzuki is leaving his job as the host of The Nature of Things. Hello, I'm David Suzuki. I'm David Suzuki. Hello, I'm David Suzuki. From combative confrontations... It's not enough, to, ...to some lighter moments you may not have seen. We're looking back at a groundbreaking career. That's coming up. Plus, the Newfoundland community struggles to move forward. This is something that's impacted everybody, not just people who lost their homes. We return to Port of Basque one month after Fiona, and a little later. An unforgettable encounter for some BC scuba divers. I was just shocked. <laughs> There's no words to describe it. They're close up with this creature from the deep. We're back in two. There is relief tonight on the southern slope of Africa's tallest mountain. A fire on Mount Kilimanjaro is under control after burning for well over 24 hours. You can see how high the smoke billowed above the tents and people in the foreground. No casualties have been reported, at least not so far. About 500 people pitched in to fight the flames, and that included many civilians. The fire broke out near a site used by climbers at the 4,000-meter mark, and human activity is suspected as the cause. Hurricane Rosalind slammed ashore on Mexico's Pacific coast this morning as a Category 3 storm. It made landfall near a port of Vallarta, but the popular resort city avoided a direct hit. A number of power outages have been reported. Rosalind weakened as it headed over land. 
People are still picking up the pieces in storm-battered Port of Bass, Newfoundland. It has been a month since Fiona devastated that tiny community, and the damage is still quite evident. Troy Turner met some there who have lost everything and still don't know what the future holds. For Austin Taylor and his family, the waiting has been hard, waiting for answers, waiting for help. He's been out of his home since Fiona tore through his neighborhood last month. The house stands, but it's been condemned, so he and his family won't be returning. It's very hard. Like, I mean, we've worked hard for 28 years just to own it. And we've last, within the last two years, we've owned it. We're doing more money, spending more for like, getting renovations done. All of a sudden, you're left with nothing. Taylor says it's been hard on everyone, but especially his adult daughter, who has a rare genetic condition that causes cognitive and physical impairment. She wanted to go home, and you, where she was handicapped, you couldn't explain her that she couldn't go home no more. She would just rip her house, put in the car, and took away. And like she can't understand why she can't go back. Tattered homes, left barely standing, piles of debris collected in neighborhoods. Many say it's a different town. Before you used to be able to go to a grocery store and say, hi, how you doing? And how's your day going? And now when you go to a grocery store, people just merely nod or shake their head. Everybody's mentality has been altered. Uh, you know, this is something that's impacted everybody, not just people who lost their homes. Next steps are something the mayor has been working on, hour after hour, every day since the waves tore his town apart. I know today is uh, pretty bleak. Uh, I know it's been a, a, a lot of stuff has been shattered in, in one's life, but uh, I'm figuring that tomorrow we'll, we'll get to a brighter day and we'll get there at some point here, but we are going to get there. While it's been weeks since homes were torn from their foundation from the ocean and neighborhoods were ravaged by this storm, there's still yet to be a lot of answers as to what will happen next. The town, it says, is working with all levels of government to find those answers soon. Troy Turner, CBC News, Port of Basque. Another piece of famous artwork has been targeted by climate protesters. This time it was a Monet at a museum in Germany. Activists with a group called Last Generation threw mashed potatoes onto the painting and then glued themselves to the wall. Earlier this month, climate protesters threw tomato soup at a Van Gogh in London. In both cases, officials say the paintings were protected by glass and weren't damaged. David Suzuki has been bringing the natural world into our living rooms for more than 40 years. But as we're reporting tonight, he's stepping aside as host of the CBC program, The Nature of Things. I've wanted to retire for a long time. I'm way past my best before date. Coming up, we'll look back together at the moments that have defined his career. Plus, a new model of care showing great potential, how it could speed up surgical wait times. Interesting setting to announce some major breaking news. But David, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be uh, retiring from the nature of things at the end of this season. Hello, I'm David Suzuki. I'm David Suzuki. Hello, I'm David Suzuki. So how many years has it been? 44? Yeah. Welcome to the nature of things. The nature of things. I think this is an appropriate question to ask somebody who's on the verge of, uh, of retiring. How, how do you want to be remembered? When I'm dead, I don't give a shit what people think about me. I'll be dead, so... Um, I've done my job. So why now? Why have you made the decision to retire? I've wanted to retire for a long time. I'm way past my best before date, but for a long time uh, it was felt if I, I'd become so closely identified with the show that uh, if I left, they might cancel the series. But gradually it was clear that we could be re ready for another host, and I think it's about time. <laughs> so over the years, so many people have watched the program in so many countries, right? It's had a mm -hmm. huge impact on lots of people. But I know the program has had a huge impact on you. In particular, there was an interview you did in 1982, 40 years ago on what was then Queen Charlotte Islands, now okay. Haida Gwaii, speaking to Guja, a Haida artist. Tell me what's so significant about that interview. 
For me, it really changed my insight as an environmentalist. I'm on Windy Bay in the Queen Charlotte Islands off the coast of British Columbia. We go up to Haida Gwaii, and uh, I didn't know anything about uh, First Nations at that time. It was here that the Haida Indians hunted and fished. They used these trees to build their totems, their dugouts, and their longhouses. And I interview the forest company executives, loggers, Haida environmentalists, and logging was providing jobs for many Haida. So I said to Gujao, one of the guys that had been leading the fight against logging, what difference does it make to you if the trees are all cut down? A forest like that, the ocean, and, and those things are what, what keep us as, as Haida people. If they're logged off, we'll, we'll probably end up the same as everyone else, I guess. I thought, what the heck? He said, to be me as a Haida, it means being connected to the air, the water, the fish, the trees. All of that is what makes them who they are. For me, it started a whole new chapter in, in my life. We are intimately connected. There's no separation between us and the air, between us and, and nature. In 2022, to hear you give that message sounds kind of in balance with a lot of things, including public opinion. But back in 1982, did you feel like you and the small group of people who describe themselves as environmentalists, did you feel sometimes like you were shouting into the wind? Well, no. I've never felt that uh, we were voices in the wilderness. There were always people calling for change, but we were up against very powerful forces. We had a bullet fired through our window here during the fights over forests in the 80s. If they think you can cut down a virgin forest and pay a bunch of kids to go and stick seedlings in the ground and somehow that's reforestation, they've got rocks in their head. There were towns in BC during those battles when, well, basically I was told, don't you show your face around here. I was jogging up in Haida Gwaii and a truck came by and he saw me and he slowed down. I thought he wanted to talk, so I jog up to him and he immediately healed the truck over and drove me into the ditch. You certainly don't back down from a fight and don't seem fearful. And another piece of tape we're going to play is you being uh, tough with uh, John Baird, the environment minister at the time. You know, what you promised was a long way from what you delivered. Was a... You're laughing now. What was your motivation for that? Well, I was trying to nail him because he had been appointed by a Harper government, which was very hostile to any discussion about climate change. Ed Baird was brought in and saying, you know, we know that climate change is real, which was a big deal. But then he was just papering everything over and, and there was an opportunity. It's not enough, John. You know, there's a lot of opportunity. Please come and see us. We're very happy. Okay. I didn't go there looking for him. I just happened to be there and he was there. But hell, I mean, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, the, the big fear is when you're up against a logger and uh, he's mad as hell. That's a much more direct physical threat. Any politician who tells you these products are safe is either very, very stupid or they're lying. Where is a sense of urgency? Have we so polluted our environment, we've got to buy water in bottles? Your approach has been to be, I mean, choose your adjective, aggressive, some might say say abrasive. How do you feel about that approach now? Well, I wish I'd been more aggressive than I was wow. then. You see, I was taught a very important lesson from my dad in high school. I became the president of the student body and uh, there was some issue. I can't remember what the issue was, but I gave some namby-pamby answer and my dad said, why the hell did you say that? You don't, that's not what you think. And I said, oh, I didn't want people to be mad at me. Boy, did he get mad at me. <laughs> he said, what the hell are you going to stand for? If you want everybody to, to like you, he said, then you're not going to stand for anything. There are always going to be people who will object to or disagree with you. My dad was my big teacher, and he kicked my ass on that and said, if you believe the things, you've got to stand up and expect people to fight against you. Even today, I mean, there's a huge amount of respect for you, but there's also people who kind of push back. Yes. And you've been criticized before for having a relatively large, gorgeous house. How do you square that with being an environmentalist? Well, I bought the house 48 years ago, and uh, we've lived here. My uh, in-laws, my mother-in-law and father-in-law lived upstairs for 35 years. This is 
Severn, and we're standing right outside where she's going to live for the rest of her life. This is going to be home. Our daughters grew up here with Grandpa and Grandma upstairs. This is our home. This isn't a piece of real estate. This is our home, and I'm honored and, and privileged to have bought this home right on the water. And of course, over 48 years, the value of property skyrockets, but that's the, the history which people can take or not take. I think the important thing is that this kind of attack is used as somehow a reason to avoid whatever I'm saying. But that doesn't mean the message isn't real. These glasses are rotating my world 180 degrees. One of the things we try to do in these interviews is show things about the subject that people haven't usually seen. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> these are some scenes and outtakes from nature things. There are three kinds of people. Those who understand numbers and those who don't. The world of science has something for everyone. The sports buff. <laughs> Within a single species, an explosion of cultures. From a single brain, <laughs> from a single brain, a veritable cascade. <laughs> it's nice to see a different David Suzuki there. What does this montage say about you? Well, I mean, we had a lot of fun while we were doing it. I did my first television series. It was just a local uh, channel in 1962. And at that time, I thought, you know, people need to be educated about science. Where the hell is science? It's the most important factor shaping our lives today. You know, and I always thought of TV as kind of a cesspool, but I thought my programs are gonna glisten like jewels. <laughs> but what I found is when you jump into a cesspool, you look like a turd like everybody else. Let's talk about science some more, because uh, you know, I, I think from the perspective of being in the pandemic now, we're gonna look back at the speed and, and efficiency with which scientists produced so many vaccines as, as maybe a high point for science. But at the same time, we have discovered so many people who misunderstand science, misuse information about science. And, and I just wonder, as a scientist, when you look at, at, at that public reaction now, good and bad, what does that tell you about society and science? Well, you know, it's, it's something I despair at. People have access in any cheap cell phone. They've got access to virtually all the information in the world. But they're not better informed. It's brainwashing by the media. There is an enormous mistrust of science as part of the elite. And that is terrifying to me because the fundamental message of environmentalism is we are all united. We belong to one species. <laughs> okay, let's get the city in the background. I've spoken to some people before who are on the verge of retirement and they seem tired and their passion seems to have quelled. That's not the case with you at all. You have lots of energy, lots of passion. I'm tired, I'm tired. <laughs> I am in a very privileged state. I'm an elder and as an elder, this is the most important part of my life because I have no vested interest in the status quo. I don't have to kiss anybody's ass in order to get a job or a raise or a promotion. Now I'm in a position of sifting through a lifetime and saying, what have I learned from that that I can pass it on? That's my job. And I say to every elder, what have you learned from your life? You know, I'd like to have retired uh, company CEOs, retired economists, come out of the woodworks for Christ's sake and tell us the truth that this economic system is what is driving us into the ditch. Sounds like we're gonna still keep hearing from you. I have no choice. I have no choice. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. The passion still very much there and consider this, at 86 years old, David has been hosting The Nature of Things for longer than many Canadians have been alive. His 44th and final season starts this January. An Ontario doctor is testing a new model aimed at cutting down long surgical wait times. We essentially make this quicker, cheaper, faster, and better for patients. 
Coming up, the promising results for patients. Plus, an amazing moment for some BC divers getting up close and personal with an octopus. There is hopeful news tonight for Canadians anxiously awaiting surgeries that are deemed non-urgent. One Ontario doctor has tested his plan for streamlined surgery centres that treat more patients in less time, all in the public health system. Christine Birak shows us why its promising results could be duplicated across the country. The pandemic has added a whole new layer of patients into the healthcare system. To deal with the crush inside our hospitals, doctors say we need system level solutions. Inside this building in London, Ontario, is a model for speeding up general surgeries. And we're going to show you how it works. Can I get a 2 also? Okay. Proline, Proline, please. This surgery will change Mary Curry's life. She's had foot pain for months. It's physically limiting and psychologically exhausting, but her pain is not life-threatening. Can you hold me a small uh, wire too? If not for Abdel Rahman Lewendi, this procedure probably would have been pushed down a growing list of non-urgent surgeries. The average wait time in Canada last year was about 25 weeks. Curry waited roughly 14 for this moment. You're going to be able to walk on your heel today. It feels like you're inside a hospital, but it's not. This is an ambulatory surgical center. Ambulatory means the ability to walk. All patients, like Curry, who have surgery here, go home the same day. A little groggy, but pretty good. While there are similar clinics in Canada, London's Ambulatory Surgical Centre is part of the public health care system. It's backed by evidence and a well-known donor. There are two operating rooms here and staff perform between 10 and 15 surgeries a day, mostly orthopedic, but also some hernias, and they perform them at least 30% faster than in the hospital. This is a standard OR room So here? this is a standard operating room. Uh, it's a standard Dr. Lewendi is an orthopedic surgeon. In 2016, he started looking for ways to make the city's large hospital operating rooms more efficient. I kind of mapped out or modeled the OR in terms of its inputs, throughputs and outputs and thought, how can we essentially make this quicker, cheaper, faster and better for patients? Large hospital operating rooms must be prepped and ready for anything, whether it's a simple knee replacement or complex cancer surgery. It's all done in a critical care zone, which requires about six medical staff per operating room. And every surgery starts with a full range of sterilized medical tools, just in case. Surgery is very steeped in culture. Things are done a certain way because they're done a certain way. So if you were to model the operating room as a block, like this. Preliminary findings from his research suggest things can be done differently. In a trial involving a thousand patients, surgery care costs in the conventional or large hospital operating rooms ran about $469 per patient. In the high efficiency or ambulatory center, it was $172. The cost difference in labor and materials is roughly 60%, as less complex surgeries often require fewer staff, less time, and smaller medical toolkits. By cutting all of that stuff out, you essentially can bring the cost, drive the cost down significantly, and then increase the efficiency, which in our system doesn't necessarily translate to saving more money. It translates to treating more patients. Research suggests patients treated in regulated ambulatory centers also have fewer post-surgery complications. Sounds like a win-win, but shifting culture is never easy. It was a bit frightening at first. <laughs> Jillian Holborough manages the operating rooms at the ambulatory surgical center and the larger ones in the nearby London hospital. She's seen firsthand how streamlining surgeries made the hospital more efficient. 
being able to take smaller procedures out of these big operating rooms just allows us to be able to uh, do more surgery. And patients like Anne Maddock reap the benefits. You know, we hear the horror stories of patients waiting months and months for simple procedures. So this, this is just incredible. So lucky to have it so close to the main hospital. She's waited about three months for her foot surgery. Within the hour, it'll be done. The Ontario government is looking at this public system model as a way to safely speed up surgeries. Based on the evidence, Dr. Lewendi and many other docs hope this will be the future of care for Canadians. I do think it's scalable, but I guess the will has to be to, to scale it. London Health Sciences has plans to scale up this ambulatory surgical centre from two to six operating rooms so more patients can have their surgery, go home and get on with their lives. Take care. Thank you. Christine Birak, CBC News, London, Ontario. And if these surgical centres were rolled out across the province, wait times could be cut even shorter. The Ontario Medical Association says it's working with the government to create a centralized referral system so if a patient were willing to travel, they could take advantage of an earlier opening in another city. Coming up on The National in our moment. It was like bowling and golfing, like giving me an octopus hug. An eight-limbed embrace from a deep sea creature, this surprising underwater encounter is next. And we'd like to congratulate our CBC News colleague, Ashley Burke, tonight. She received one of Canadian journalism's highest honours this weekend. I'm really in awe of all of the journalists here and that they go to the Hill every day and that they push for answers, that they demand accountability. I just think... Ashley was awarded the prestigious Charles Lynch Award at the annual Parliamentary Press Dinner Gallery in Ottawa. She shared it with Global News reporter Mercedes Stevenson. And it was presented by former CBC reporter and host Don Newman. Ashley was recognized for her coverage of workplace issues at Rideau Hall under former Governor General Julie Payotte. Well, not many people have come face to face with one of these creatures. Fewer still have touched one, but diver Andrea Humphrey sure has. On a recent dive, her goal was just to spot an octopus. She got that and much more. Her amazing up-close encounter is our moment. I've done, like I said, 675 dives and never had an experience where the octopus was that curious and interactive. It just came over, came, came up to me, approached me and started crawling on my camera. And yeah, I was just shocked. <laughs> There's no words to describe it. It was just like, oh my gosh, this is happening to me. And then um, one point it came and climbed up on my body and it was like fully engulfing, like giving me an octopus hug and, and it had its tentacles like up um, on my lip and I could feel the suckers sucking on the top lip. It feels, it feels like small vacuum cleaners, but the strength in it was just incredible. And yeah, I ended up with an octopus hook kicky after that. The emotions I was feeling were like just pure amazement. I think you can hear it on that video, like me just screaming and squealing. This video is just one of those feel good moments. It kind of sparks our curiosity and our amazement and wonder for the aquatic ocean world. So as you can hear, no anxiety on her part and apparently no anxiety on the part of the octopus either. She says that when that happens, the octopus will turn kind of grayish and shoot ink. Uh, in this case, uh, the octopus didn't change color and stayed with her for 40 minutes. So uh, an amazing encounter. That is The National for October 23rd. Thanks for watching and have a good night.